it's interesting enough to ask what the position of Jung is in the modern academic world. But I think more importantly, the position he holds is in the in the social imagination. So his he's not really referenced so much in your mainstream university psychology or even religious studies. Um, so you might say that his works are kind of a flop, but that's not really the realm where his works seem to have had their influence in. And that area is, as I said, uh, the social sphere. <clears throat> um, I think really what he represents um, is the justification of intuition. So what Jung did is he took something which has very little standing in our modern intellectual realm called intuition. And he gave it a, a psychological treatment thorough enough that he kind of justified it. Now, that doesn't mean to say that intuition should take supremacy and that we should all aspire to be the Luciferian leader, lyrical leader of the choir. But it does mean that when we're knocking around in our imaginations and struggling to find some kind, any kind of uh, force that will rebuild the floor. And by that, of course, I'm, I mean... We're all here after having had the floor, the ground, drawn from beneath us, or have it, have, having had it disappear from beneath us as we're walking through our lives. And I think what Jung offers is, first, a shock. If you haven't already had that visceral feeling of the carpet sliding from underneath you, then reading Jung will certainly cement that feeling. Unlike most other authors, instead of just leaving you in the lurch, he actually provides you with some of the tools. And what he, the tools he provides are intuitional. And what I mean by that is that he gives you, by reading him, he arms your intuitions with the tools to actually build. It's hard to exactly say what I mean by that, because I think we know what, what I mean when I say there was a ground that was lost, and Jung allows us the tools, the intuitional tools, to rebuild it. But I want to grasp something about the experience of that building. There's some kind of automatic, worm-like wriggling and oscillation and, and churning in the intuitions. And if they can be activated, and the churning can be allowed to take place, and the windmill can be freed to spin and be driven on by the wind, then there is a natural development. And why what's happening there is that the the churning of the intuitions is eventually results in the conditions wherein those intuitions can build upon each other. It's as though um, the intuitions, uh, normally they move past each other and they don't have any connection. But if they're allowed enough freedom of movement, eventually they hit this very unlikely position where they can fit together and instead of moving as totally independent entities, there's actually a patterned and emergent order to the way that they behave. Um, if you've ever seen the trick where you take an upside down cup and um, some dice on a table or a flat surface, say you have four or five uh, dice, you can sit the cup upside down on top of those dice and then you can slide it from side to side very quickly and uh, if you if you can pay attention to the to the dice and if you do a lot of practice eventually you can just by wobbling the cup from side to side you can actually get the dice to sit on top of each other because they're just moving around randomly but once they hit that position where they line up there's, a, there's an increased stability now that stability isn't very great, 
So it's very easy to knock down that tower of dice, but it still does create that stability. And I think what Jung does is he arms the intuitions with the tools necessary to create that stability.